Welcome to the Forge of Freedom podcast. I'm your host, Alex Uli, and this is episode 149 of the Forge of Freedom. Today I'm joined again by John Richardson, the man behind the only Guns and Money blog. Uh, we were together uh, just a little over a month ago to record episode 144. Of course, we recorded that episode uh, that was mid-July, and that was before the uh, conclusion of the bench trial anyway in the uh, case in New York by the New York Attorney General against the NRA. And so we're going to pick back up with that here in just a little bit, but we're also going to chat a little bit about John's experience at the first annual Goals Conference in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is, of of course, a a, a conference that was put on by Gun Owners of America there in Knoxville, Tennessee, not too far from from John uh, there in North Carolina. Unfortunately, I was not able to make it, so I'm looking forward to getting john's take on that we didn't even talk about his experience pre-show here so uh, i'm getting his take fresh just like the rest of you so with all that said john welcome back to the show thanks for having me back i appreciate it yeah and i should say we're going to finish up a sort of a third segment at the end so uh, for those of you interested uh, stay tuned Uh, for the end we're going to talk about a recent announcement that john made that he's going to be or is already running for the NRA Board of Directors. So we'll get into that toward the end of the show. Uh, so with all that said, John, uh, tell us about about the Goals Conference there in Knoxville, Tennessee. It, it did, I guess it was a two-day conference, but there were some uh, events going up, I believe, for media beforehand. Did you go to any of that? I did. Uh, we st- It was on Thursday and Friday. It was for media only. Uh, Thursday was a range day out in the Sweetwater Valley of Tennessee. It was about an hour bus ride from downtown Knoxville. It, the best way I could describe it, it, it was like a mini industry day at the range. Um, very well run, a little warm, but they had tons of water for us. Um, you had vendors such as Smith & Wesson, who now is out of Maryville, Tennessee, which is not that far away. Uh, Glock was there. Um, Henry Arms, SDS Imports, which is uh, out of Knoxville. And then you had a lot of smaller uh, vendors who may not have been able to get in at the SHOT Show, but it was very well attended. Um, I think all told they had 40 vendors, and there was... uh, they were showing off everything from full auto to a single shot, single, a pen that it lets you shoot a 22 long rifle out of it. It was developed initially during World War II for the OSS as like a secret weapon, hidden weapon, and supposedly one of the guys that had it you know, killed eight Germans with it, so... It was, sounds like something out of a, a 007 James Out of you know, a James 007 Bond. CIA type thing. Um, <laughs> exactly. It wasn't. It was seven hundred and fifty dollars. So it's a little out uh, of my price range, and it's also an NFA item. So, I had another couple hundred. But there were a lot of suppressors. Um, I got to shoot stuff like the uh, the Smith and Wesson eighteen fifty four lever action with a suppressor on it, which was pretty fun. Some full auto stuff. So all told, it was a pretty good event. The next day, they had set aside so that the media could meet with the vendors face-to-face. It was... It wasn't crowded. Obviously, it wasn't crowded. And they made a big effort to reach out to especially the newer media, the YouTubers, the pl- podcasters of the world. And then thir- then Saturday and Sunday was a full range. You know, the public was invited. If you were a GOA member, it was free. Uh, the location was the Knoxville Convention Center, which had been the site of the 1982 World's Fair, which I actually had attended way, way back then. Um, Location was very nice. Parking was great. 
I did not get to attend as much of the panels and discussions as I would have liked. I was also helping out with Grassroots North Carolina, our local state level gun rights group. And um, Saturday was fairly crowded. Sunday, not so much. More like your typical gun show where it opens in the morning and it's a few people, then the church crowd comes in. So all in all, I thought it was a, a good conference. I don't think they they were hoping to get 50,000 people. I would not think that they got nearly that many. 15, I, maybe 20. I, I, I would think that 50 is a pretty lofty goal for a first annual yeah, event. Yeah, I, I would say so. And the best way I could describe it is it was like the Gun Rights Policy Conference with speakers meets the NRA annual meeting with vendors and toss in a little bit of the SHOT Show. And, you know, you throw all three together and you got the GOA goals. And I'm sure it will evolve a little bit over time, but and maybe you didn't get a sense for this, but uh, I guess sort of my speculation was that, or I was wondering, you know, what was GOA's impetus behind this? Is it, is it that they're trying to fill a void that they perceive may exist or may exist in the future with the NRA annual meeting? Or was this something that you think they were planning to do anyway? Do you have any sense for that? Not a direct sense, but I would say it definitely built a void. One of my goal, one of the things I was trying to do there was, you know, see how many people were actually voting members of NRA. And in terms, even with the media, um, there was much less than I would have expected. A lot of people had dropped annual memberships and said, or never had become members of the NRA, thinking that it was too conciliatory, too accommodating to the other side. Um, but you know. in, in, in of all the organizations that support the right to keep and bear arms, you know, the, the NRA has its hand in a number of different arenas. The Second Amendment Foundation is obviously mostly engaged in, in litigation along with Firearms Policy Coalition. Uh, GOA is sort of the, the closest analog, uh, in my estimation, to the NRA in terms of uh, the sorts of things that they do in terms of lobbying and litigation and sort of membership engagement uh, and, you know, industry engagement too, not just uh, individual member. So I, I think that GOA is positioned to fill some of that void that the that has existed because of the loss of membership at the NRA, uh, but they're still not, they pale in comparison to, to the NRA in size. Um, do you have any thoughts about about that? I, I'm sort of just you know I think you're right. I mean, yeah. all the other organizations pale in comparison to the NRA in both budget as well as membership. Um, I see the GOA actually starting to step up its litigation a bit, even if it's merely amicus briefs. Uh, I did see some. And I'm going to crucify the name, Stephen Stamboli, Stambulia. I, like, I, I've heard it said different ways there, before. Yeah, as well, and I, I know it's not Stambolia, so because yeah. he corrected that. Um, but he was. I saw the, him there. Uh, a guy named Rob Olson out of Virginia, who's also a two A attorney. Uh, they did have a panel. Um, I know there was a panel including. Um, John Lott that was there. So you had a lot of education. I, I, because of my schedule, I didn't get to as much of it as I wanted. I did see people like uh, Mark Robinson speak. And he was, you know, he's a great speaker. I mean, everybody has probably seen the speech he gave to the Greensboro, North Carolina City Council. And the best way I can describe Mark's speaking style is he has all the best characteristics 
of a Baptist preacher or an AME Zion preacher, and he can just walk without notes and just keep speaking and speaking clearly and forcefully, very forcefully. So, um, well, I've got there. I'm going to try to put up the website here from the event um, while I'm doing that. Do you know, do they have a, a plan for next year already? You know, with the NRA annual meeting, they often announce where the next one's going to be. Are they going to do it in the same place next year or well, in a different actually, place? Well, actually, I have heard that they're going to be, do it in the same place for the next three years. Okay. And uh, Knoxville's in, I call it Asheville light. It's not as, I mean, it's a university town. And they were doing, you move into the University of Tennessee this, that weekend. That said, there's lots of hotels around. They're not overly priced unless you're downtown. There's a lot of cool stuff downtown, which we did not take advantage of. Um, but it has two, you know, two major interstates coming through there. East-West, you have Interstate 40. North-South, you have Interstate 75. Um Plus, I mean, it's the capital of East Tennessee. Um, it's when well, it's not too far from the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. No, right? so there's. In, in fact, yeah. I live just on the. I live on the other side of the park, on the yeah. quieter side of the park, as we like to call it. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it's. I mean, for me, it was a two-hour drive, and it's closer than going to see my grandkids. So. Getting well, there was for, no for, big deal. For people who didn't get to go, like me, I think uh, it's safe to say that it's worthwhile to go um, and that you should maybe plan on making it to, to Knoxville next year for the second annual event. Uh, would you agree with that? It's I would. I mean, I had friends yeah. of mine, media friends, uh, activists, one who came down from Massachusetts, another came down from New Jersey. I saw people, a friend of mine with USCCA, Beth, Beth Alcazar, came up from Birmingham. Uh, I talked to a lot of people from the West Coast who had been active with gun owners of California. So there were people from all over, people from Texas. Um, and kind of a who's who of, uh, of gun world social media. And, and uh, you know, I'm looking at the web page here, and if you scroll down, They've got a lot of handline, headliners here. Yeah. Dana Lesh, John Lovell, Brandon Herrera, and, and so on, um, Mr. Guns and Gear. But they've also got, as you were alluding to, um, a schedule of uh, events and speakers and panels. And I assume a lot of those are – Let's pull, I'll just pull them up here. Let's see. A lot of them are sort of educational talks. Like there's things ranging from homeschooling to – um, you know, hunting panel. Uh, so there's all sorts of things that, uh, you know, educational sorts of material there. Yeah. I mean, I went to the Southeast regional meetup and they introduced a lot of the, the people from Florida, West Virginia, the leaders, the state level leaders for GOA, um, you know, saying their goal is eventually to have a representative in every state, a GOA employee, as far as I understand. Um, I know in terms of grassroots North Carolina, it was a very successful. We raised a lot of money for our political victory fund. We sold some memberships. All in all, it was it worked out really well for us. Good, good, good. Well, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. It went well. I, I really wanted to make it down there this year, but wasn't able to. So I'm glad to hear from you that that it that it went well, and that it was it was good for the grassroots organization there that you were you were helping out. Yeah. Um, what else do you think folks should know about about goals? Or is there any? Did you have any other parting thoughts about it before we move on to the status of the the NRA case? I think they should understand that it's a first time event. Um, it was out of their, out of 
GOA's comfort zone, I think. They had not, they didn't have years of experience putting this on. It's not like it was the 39th or 40th GRPC or God knows how many annual meetings the NRA has put on. Um, they, they, tr they brought in some good people. They brought in a lot of excellent people. There was a chance to network. Uh, and it, I wish it was more crowded. On Sunday, it wasn't, but, you know, tell me where else that you could park at a major event like this and even during the week pay $7 for parking for the whole day. And then on the weekend, it was free in a parking garage. So in terms of cost for attending it, even if you're just driving for the day, you're not out a lot of pocket. Yeah. Well, it not being crowded is is a good and a bad thing, right? I mean, you want it to be crowded. You, you want, want it to be crowded. To be successful, um, but but you maybe now is a good time to go before it starts getting too crowded. Before <laughs> before it catches on in the fourth or fifth, and there are fifty, sixty thousand people there, um, and, right? And I've been to a number of grass or gun rights policy conferences, and the one thing I would say about goals panels is that you have more time to hear the panel because they don't try to cram quite as much stuff into it versus GRPC. I love both. It's just, and I think you have more chance to pick and choose. Whereas with GRPC, you start on Saturday morning and you go to Sunday noon and it's the same. You're everybody's in the same place. They're not breakouts, unlike uh, goals. Well, well, speaking of GRPC, it's in San Diego this year yep. in in September. Um, are you planning to go to GRPC? As things stand now, probably not. Um, that could change. Uh, yeah. It's a little bit more expensive for me to get out to the West Coast. And lodging is a little bit more expensive, so I'm just a poor retiree, actually. Well, you know, I and maybe you have some of the same reluctance that I do. I, I, I love the event. It's a great uh, opportunity to to see people you don't get to see very often. Great folks, um, and it's a great opportunity to to learn a lot and about you know what's going on in the the litigation world, especially with respect to the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, but it's in California, and I really don't want to go to California. And I can't uh, blame for you. A gun rights conference. Well, think about this: goals was in the Knoxville Convention Center, which on any normal day forbid you from carrying concealed, forbid you from even having a pocket knife. They bent over backwards for GOA and suspended that rule. There was nobody wanding you down. And there were a lot of people that were armed, openly or concealed. Yeah, uh, ask me to go to, to Texas or, or Tennessee uh, or Indiana, you know, um, Indianapolis. I'll plug Indianapolis is a great place for a convention. It is. But ask me to go to California. Oh, man, and I just don't get terribly excited to, to go to um, the belly of the beast, so to speak, where, mm -hmm. where gun rights go to die so so often. So uh, And... Uh, and in defense of GRPC, uh, the very first one I went to was in San Francisco, and they put it in, definitely in the belly of the beast for that very reason. There, there are a lot of gun right activists in California still. Um, once you get in off off the coast, it's almost like a normal free state. Yeah, yeah, and they they held it in Chicago on a few occasions. Yep as well i remember and the you know, same situation there once you get outside of chicago it's about as conservative as as any state yeah um, I, but, my in-laws used to when they were alive were in southern illinois outside of st louis and it was red america yeah well um let's get into what's going on with the nra we talked about goa and their first annual conference there in, yeah. in knoxville uh, let's move on to what's going on with the NRA. When we last spoke in July, 
Uh, we were waiting for the bench trial to conclude where the, the judge would decide what sort of consequence there should be as a result of the jury verdict from earlier this year. And basically the, the main question was whether or not the judge would order a court appointed monitor, somebody to oversee basically the, the operation of the NRA. The judge did not uh, order a monitor, uh, but didn't in fact issue a final order uh, of, of sorts yet. So there's no, not really not a yet. conclusion. Would you mind to tell us, tell us a little bit about what's going on there? I mean, he somewhat, he, he said, basically, I'm not going to impose a special monitor, but he did come up with an interim decision that had six points. Um, number one was to integrate the compliance commitment into a court order. And the compliance commitment was saying, we're going to be more open. The audit committee will be voted on by the entire board. Um, we're going to vet candidates. That has not been voted on. It's just been suggested. The next thing he said is that they should open up for at least the next three years uh, nominations to the board, such that any basically anyone who wanted to run would be on the ballot. There was to be the NRA was going to have to hire a compliance, an advisory only compliance uh, consultant at their own expense, but advisory only. Uh, let's see, those are three. Um, and I'll, I think I've you've got this on your website. Uh, I'm going to try to pull that up while we're yeah. Uh, Alter the committee here. membership. That, in other words, people who had been in leadership positions or even on committees such as audit and finance during the years under consideration, which I think was from like. 2015 through 2022. So that would be people like former NRA president Charles Cotton, um, former uh, second vice president David Coy. Uh, uh, those people should not be in on those committees or in positions of power. Um, and speaking of which, um, they were Wayne LaPierre. Uh, one of the results here was that Wayne LaPierre was uh, issued a 10 year ban uh, from participating or in, 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 was it any fashion or just a leadership role within the NRA? Um, but that was part of the, the relief. A the, leadership the order. or consultancy type role, anything where it involved money or. Uh, anything that would have to do with anything with a fiduciary duty. Yeah. And I've got the uh, people watching this podcast by video. will see I've got John's website up here, No Lawyers, Only Guns and Money. And this is his article that he uh, that John released right after the, the trial ended. It says, New York trial ends with a whimper and not a bang. And I'll, of course, link to this in the show notes. But... One of the it talks a little bit about what the judge did, and and I'll link to the order uh, from the court as well. But you'll see here the snippet that John included in the blog post about these six sort of action items that he expects to to see addressed before they come back before the court. Um, and and one of the issues it, it, we'll go through some of these, which you've already been addressing to some degree, um, but. So the, what's really going on right now, right, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the judge said, these are the six things that I want you to address. Go out and discuss among yourselves. Try to negotiate some resolution, some way to address these with between the NRA and the New York Attorney General. Um, and if you can't come to any sort of agreement or settlement, uh, submit your proposals, and then he'll make a decision. Is that your understanding That's about what's exactly supposed right. to happen? That's exactly right. They met on August 12th. They also met again 
this past Monday, the 19th. I have no idea what happened from that meeting. And then there will be another one, uh, a final meeting bef to submit stuff to the judge on August 27th. I have and seen some initial proposals. For example, where the judge in, in number five says, creating more protection so the compliance officer position to make it such that you vote on it. It's a three-year term of office. Well, they've I think they've come to an agreement where instead of making it a three-year position, the, the position, whoever holds that position will have a very strong contract with large severance agreement. So they're protected. And it, if they were to replace the person, it would be very costly to the NRA. So, and I think the New York Attorney General's office said, okay, we can live with that. Um, number six, I think it will go, to, eventually something will go to the membership where the board is going to be, go from 76 members down to, let's say, 20 or 25 but adding, like many universities, a board of advisors. They haven't figured out quite how they want to do that yet. Um, I mean, it's something I've been advocating for a long time. Um, you have yeah, the, and we talked about this yeah. a little bit last month. You know, the, the, the board is just so large. It's hard for the, and, and so sort of clumsy because of how many members it has. Uh, that it's just really hard to be effective with so many members. You're uh, absolutely right. And I think the judge recognized that the court, everybody has recognized it for years. A board of 76 members sounds like, oh, we're giving everybody representation. But in the reality is that there's nobody holding the executives, the hirelings, for lack of a better word, accountable. Staff does what staff wants, and the board just goes along. And I think that's in any org, any nonprofit organization. It's why you see corporate boards, you know, public corporations, their boards usually are no more than 10 to 15 members. Yeah, and for much larger organizations, oftentimes than the NRA. And dealing know, with a lot more money. Right, exactly. So... I, Part of the reason I read the, the title of your article is so people can go and look for it more easily. But also, I, I think I, I like the title because it says the trial ends with a whimper, not a bang. And part of the reason I like that is because this was not a huge win for either side. Correct. The New York Attorney General didn't get the compliance, the court-appointed compliance monitor, um, the NRA... Uh, you know, still has to make some significant changes to, to comply with what I think the judge expects. So this was sort of a mixed bag from both sides, uh, not a complete loss, not a complete win for, for either side of the case. Now, I know some folks, and I'd like to get your input on this or take, uh, I know at NRA and Danger, they were a bit pessimistic about the outlook for the NRA, um, basically that without a monitor, they don't see that the NRA will make the necessary changes that it needs to make. Um, what are your thoughts about that? As I did in, there was a letter that went out after the August 12th meeting of the Special Litigation Committee, Brewer, et cetera, with the New York AG's office. And there are people in the old guard, the cabal, who are resisting change, just like the segregationists did in the 1950s and 1960s, with all due deliberate speed. They are just dragging their feet. Um, for example, opening up the elections. They're saying, well, you know, the bylaws don't allow us to do something like that. And it's in black letters, so we really can't do that. Yeah, well, the judge could do say, 
I, I really like your bylaw, but we're going to do it. And then they say, well, maybe we should have it such that, let me see if I can get the exact wording. The expanding the, the board candidacy. One option would be that uh, they would do set forth transparent merit-based qualifications for recruiting directors. I mean, basically, it says a friend of mine who used to be the lobbyist, contract lobbyist for the NRA in Illinois said to me once, the antis can write the law any such way they want in Illinois, and they're going to do it. But if you let me write the definitions, in this case, the merit-based qualifications, I will win every time. So merit-based qualifications is a great way to exclude people you don't want on the board or they don't want on the board. It's not what the judge wants. And they, I don't know who wrote the letter. I don't know whether it really was Barr or whether it was somebody in Brewer staff that actually wrote the letter and Barr just signed it. But they're still not recognizing what Judge Cohn wants to have see happen. And they're even referring to, well, you know, we're trying to work with the enemy outside the gates. I think he said, knock this garbage off. And they're not doing it. They're not recognizing that every time they do garbage like this, and there's no way the judge doesn't see it, and the AG's office doesn't see it, that it's going to be worse and worse for those, for the NRA. It's going to be stricter and stricter because they won't do it themselves. And they don't recognize that, well, we didn't lose. It was a victory for us. No, it wouldn't be a victory. It's never been a victory. It's been a loss no matter which way you look at it, just from the very fact that they went to trial. We never should have ever been in this position. So, I, I put up on the screen here the article I was referring to from NRA in Danger. Of course, it's nraindanger.wordpress.com, and I'll link to this particular article in the in the show notes. But it says, I suppose, sadly, the organization is doomed. It did make it to 153 years, which is a good lifespan. People will study its destruction as a case study in how to ruin a major nonprofit. And they go on to talk about how there were some more optimistic takes at some other news outlets, particularly this courthouse news who was covering on I know closely um, on on X. Uh, but that's a pretty p pessimistic viewpoint there that that without this sort of monitor, this sort of uh, very intense oversight that maybe this cabal will run the organization into the ground. And I know that's a huge concern, but as you say, I think what the the cabal is going to run into to the wall uh, that the judge sets, you know, with his expectations, and I, and I'm thinking that they're going to have to come into compliance with those six things that the judge outlined to to satisfy the judge. I think they're not only going to have to come into compliance with the letter of the law, the letter of what he said, but also with the spirit. If if it if the New York AG's office agrees to something that does not the spirit of what Judge Cohn is pushing, then I think NRA in danger very well may be correct. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes from what I understand. For example, I heard that the Special Litigation Committee is saying, oh, we're in charge of everything, and they kept... Uh, Bill Bockenberg, first VP, Mark Vaughn, second VP, and Doug Hamlin out of the negotiations. So you have two of the cabal, two of the people who allowed this garbage to go on, plus one who goes along with it, doing the negotiating for the NRA. That just doesn't cut it. I'm sorry. It just does not cut it. Which makes it seem likely that there won't be a, an agreement reached and that each side will have to submit a proposal and leave it up to the judge. 
Yeah. Is that that would yeah. probably, I mean obviously we don't we, we don't know the outcome, uh, but that seems like the likely outcome in my view. That seems a more likely outcome. Um I had a very interesting conversation earlier today with a former director who has got who was knows the bylaws inside and out and he questions the uh, the people on the special litigation committee claiming that they have such power and he's pointing to the bylaws and saying no you really don't because you can never have any more power than the executive committee and they're assuming more powers than the executive committee so that that that's interesting. Um, yeah. I, I'm certainly not an expert on the NRA's bylaws, and I'm not not either. Um, I'm always amazed by the people who are because man, that's some tedious stuff to to read through and to get a grasp on or a, to master or get a handle of. Well, I mean, um, the you know, if you read through it, one of the things that I came across. And it's not hard to find. Is you will note that Bob Barr, as president, had the ability to name people to committees. Yes, but then he went ahead and named the the chair and the vice chair. And nowhere in the bylaws does it state that the president has the power to name the officers of a committee. That just says he can name the committee. Maybe it's implied. Maybe it's not. But there's nowhere it says it. Well, and frankly, bylaws are not particularly interesting, and, and that's partly why I think the, the NRA got astray, um, or part of the reason why is that, you know, the board of directors wasn't, um, you know, keeping up to date with what the bylaws said and what the leadership was doing and making them, uh, or at least questioning what they were doing in accordance with the bylaws. And so I, th I think there, there needs to be a much more concerted effort to do that in the future. You may remember, it was either in 2016, 2017, there was a wholesale, up, quote, updating of the bylaws. One of the things it did was make it harder to run for the board. It used to be by petition. It used to be you needed 250 names. Now it became one half of 1% of those who had voted. So this year, that's 398 valid signatures you need. Um there were other things in it that essentially made it harder to have another Cincinnati revolt. And yeah. I think they've been working on that for a long time because they don't want to get pushed out of power again. Yeah. Well, and that brings us to our, our final topic, uh, your recent announcement that you'll be running for NRA board of directors. But one last thing before we get to that, and I don't want to delay our discussion of, of your campaign here too long, but you may have seen this article. Uh, I'm not sure. I know you, you follow the NRA in danger like, like I do. There's a lot of great mm -hmm. information there in addition to your blog. Um, but I found this article at theconversation.com, and I, I, I thought this, this was a, an accurate assessment here at the end. Uh, it says, in, in my view... Uh, James, that's Attorney Gen uh, General, New York Attorney General Letitia James, has actually done a favor for the NRA by getting the courts to order that money LaPierre and other top officials spent inappropriately be returned and that the group improve its governance. Everyone has a right to appeal, of course, but because both sides can see enough victory in this ruling, it's reasonable to assume that this particular legal battle is finally ending. Uh, so there's a couple things there. Uh, I think to some degree, I mean, this case did cost a lot of money. And as you alluded to earlier, it should never have gotten this far. Uh, but with that said, without it, it's not clear that anything ever would have been fixed internally by the NRA. Mm -hmm. so, so to that extent... I think that, that this uh, article is correct and that the, the case was a favor to the NRA or to the NRA members because it brought a lot of this wrongdoing to light and gives the NRA and its membership an honor opportunity 
to to right the ship, uh, even though it was at great expense. Um, but also, it it alludes to the, what we were talking about earlier that this was, uh, as you said, it was a whimper, not a bang. It was just enough of a victory uh, for both sides, I think, to be content with the outcome. Do you think that's a fair assessment here? I think it's a fair assessment. The only thing that I would disagree with is that there are pending appeals um, by Wayne LaPierre, by Woody Phillips. No, pardon, let me take that back. Woody Phillips settled uh, by Wayne LaPierre, John Frazier, and the NRA. Um, they have appealed the judge's ruling to toss the jury verdicts, um, saying that, saying in essence, the evidence did not did not meet the standard for the jury verdicts, which I think it most certainly did. Um, but yeah, based on based on the evidence that that I heard and and read in the reporting, it seems like an appeal there is is going to be futile. It's to, a waste of money. Put it lightly. This is yeah. the bottom line. It's a waste of money, yeah. and. As the person I spoke with, the former director, says, anything that can drag this case out means more money for Bill Brewer and his attorneys, and that's not good for the NRA. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, with all that said, John, uh, the last thing I want to chat with you about, on this episode at least, is your campaign for the NRA Board of Directors. You announced recently, I don't remember the date exactly, um, there's an updated article. I think I did it on your blog. around August 9th. Okay. Yeah. Just, yeah. A, just a couple of weeks ago Yeah, uh, that you're going to be running for NRA board of directors. So tell us what, what motivated you to run and, and what do you hope to accomplish? Uh, if you're, well, if you're elected, but first of all, you've got the, I the, the get first on the hurdle of getting the, getting on the ballot. So tell us, tell us a little bit about that. What motivated you to run? Uh, at this point, and, I finally, and what do you have to do to get elected? For a long while, I thought that I could do more help to the NRA, to for NRA members, by being on the outside looking in and reporting on what I saw, stuff that had been passed on to me, and I would have no, I have no restrictions about what I could report, and that's, is, I, I still think. That's true. However, you're going to replace the cabal, the old guard. Somebody has to step up and do it. I mean, you can't just elect four for reform and hope that that changes stuff. It doesn't. You need 20 out of 25, 25 out of 25. Um, you, We have to ch turn over the board. The people that through either ignorance or willful negligence or looking the other way allowed what put us in court to happen. They need to be pushed off the board. Um, I don't, ideally they would resign. They're not going to do it. For most of these people, the greatest thing that ever happened to them in their lives is they got elected to the NRA board. I would be happy to be elected to the NRA board. It would not be the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my life. I would think my grandchildren are a lot more important. Um, so I decided to run. I talked it over with my wife, and we both went back and forth. Yeah, let's do it. And so I have a good friend of mine who was the contract lobbyist for the NRA that I referred to, Todd Vandermeid. He's the man who essentially wrote their shall issue carry law, negotiated and got Democrats on the side because downstate Democrats were in general pro-gun in Illinois. So we nominated one another. Um, so my name is before the nominating committee. They're going to be meeting on Saturday. I had to put together, they send you out a personal information sheet. You fill it out. Uh, you can add 
stuff. So I sent in a resume, which was kind of hard because I had had a resume and I lost it when my computer crashed. And I'm like, no, I'm retired. I'll never need this again. So it took me like a day and a half to put one together. And, oh, when did I have this job or that job? What board did I serve on? And I have served on nonprofit boards. I have served on a quasi-judicial governing board for a town. Uh, Even now, I'm on the board of directors for the Dallas Safari Club Carolina Foundation, one of the founders of it. So that's before the nominating committee whether or not i will they will come out and nominate me i don't know but i am also running by petition and anybody can download my petition hopefully it gets anybody who is a voting member i should say so if you're a life member of whatever level life endowment life uh patron life benefactor life all those levels count. You you can sign it and send it to me. And if you are a five-year continuous, no breaks annual member, you are also eligible to vote and you can also sign this. Uh, if you cannot find your um, membership number, the NRA actually helps petition candidates look that up. They will look it up for us. It's probably the only help they give petition candidates. So far, in hand, I probably have about 75 signatures. I need 398. I have people helping me at some large gun clubs in Illinois, large gun clubs in Pennsylvania. Um, every you know, Tuesday, I had 15 petitions come in. I've had people at training classes, for example, Carl Rain was putting on a MAG-20 class with Masada Yub and Gail Pepin. I think he got most everybody who was eligible in the class assigned, including Moss and Gail. So that was kind of cool. I had Mark Robinson sign this weekend at the Goals Conference. I was surprised that there were so many people who had been members who had let it lapse and for understandable reasons. Um, Or there were were not nearly as many people that were eligible as I would have expected. So. Yeah. So it's a pretty small pool of people to, to, to get to sign the petition if it's only people you know. So you need folks, right, not just to sign it themselves, but to share it with people they know and who are I, eligible. And I've put stuff up, and Jeff Knox gave me the suggestion that, you know, that people say the NRA is a FUD organization, be that, be whatever. So I've put it up on some hunting forums that I belong to. I've put it up at a friend of mine who just put it up on a Smith & Wesson collector and a SIG talk um board so it's it's out there and it's growing um the more i know it's on illinois carry because i had the guy ask me for my address just the other day so i get three to four emails a day saying tell me where to send this and that's good but the more the better i figure i'm going to need probably anywhere the five to six hundred just as a buffer so that somebody who might have signed who may not have been eligible um their name's going to get tossed out right yeah and i see here on your website too you mentioned you need to have these back no later than october 1st october 1st i have to have this into the nra by october 8th in the secretary's office and that would give me a day or two to fill in the blanks um and make sure everything's as good as it can be when I send it off. And yes, I'm going to overnight it to them. So I'll I'll certainly link to your webpage here where people can go and download the petition, sign it and send it back. Uh, And of course, if if other folks know people who are eligible, please share it with your your friends and family and anyone else 
If you're on a forum, a local forum or a, a mailing list, share it with your friends. I mean, this is truly a grassroots effort. I mean, yeah. I yeah, may exactly. actually get nominated by the nominations committee, nominating committee. But to be honest, I'd much rather be either by petition or duly nominated. To me, being nominated by petition means I represent the members. I'm not kowtowing to somebody on the um, nominating committee who may be trying to restrict who can or cannot be on the board. And you've got your, your email here in the, this, the blog post as well yep. for folks who JPR9954 at gmail.com. Yep. And I and, will send and, you my email, my home address. And you talked about some of your, your other experience in the, the gun world. But I mean, look here at the, the blog. You've been blogging <laughs> at Only Guns and Money. <laughs> Since May of 2010, if you look at the May, the side yeah menu here, uh, so you, and you've been following the NRA and what the politics there and and all sorts of other industry um, issues for a long time, and so I think it's there are very few people out there who have the sort of knowledge and and intimate familiarity with the NRA. Uh, in particular, in, in the gun rights world more broadly than than you do, so certainly encourage people to go download this petition, sign it, and send it back. Because, like you said, we need if if the board is um, made to be a smaller board like it should be, we need it to be composed of folks like like you and and Jeff Knox and Dennis Fusaro and Phil Journey and and the others um, who are trying to to turn the NRA in the right direction while there's still time to do it. Absolutely. All right, John. Well, um, I think that's where we'll wrap it up. Uh, I'll give you the last opportunity to say anything you'd like to say, and if there's anything else you'd like to plug. And I know you're uh, looking forward to a, to a hunting trip here soon. Uh, yeah. And um, you know, we'll. I'm sure I'll I'll ask to have you back <laughs> once we have more information about what's going on with the the NRA case and, yeah. and the judge's final decision. What I would say to everybody is that there are going to be a goodly number of reform candidates. I think upwards of 20 that have been recruited. When it comes time to vote, whether I'm on the ballot or not, you need to vote for the reform people. If we're going to take back our organization, we are going to have to do it. We can't depend upon a judge in New York or the New York AG's um, staff to do it for us. We have to do it. Uh, Obviously, I would love to be on that ballot and be a winner. Um, there are good people on the board now. But then again, there are people who have allowed stuff to go on that need to go. Uh, and it starts at the top. Um, I don't mean to be disrespectful to Mr. Barr. He's had a very interesting career. But... Uh, as things stand now, over the years, he's, I don't think he recognizes what the judge is asking for. And I think he's under the thrall of Mr. Brewer, as well as Cotton and Coy, and is not going to make the changes. And he needs to remember, he will be up for election in 2025 as a board member. If he wants to be back on the board, he needs to get his act together. So, anyway, I, this is the members need to take over. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and yeah, I, I think your point about Bob Barr is is well taken. He's uh, seems to be too close to the to the sort of uh, cabal there that got the NRA in this in this mess, and somewhat tone deaf to to what the NRA needs and what the judge expects uh, to happen to, to right the, the ship of the NRA. Um, so I, I hope that we can get some fresh uh, folks in on the board and, and in the leadership positions at the NRA. And, um, you know, I don't, it's, 
hard to say if it's too late at this point, but I, I don't think it is. And uh, I think obviously the NRA has been drained of lots of its funds and its members, uh, but I think is still uh, in a position to turn itself around. I would agree. I mean, I've been very critical of the NRA, but if I didn't want the NRA to regain its prominence, to become the 800 pound gorilla on Capitol Hill, to kill gun control bills the moment they come up, to train thousands of people every month, to back hunters, to do what it's done in the past and regain its former glory, I wouldn't bother. I would just say, fine, yeah, I spent my $500 to become a discounted life member. Well, I'll just kiss that goodbye, and I'll just concentrate on GOA and SAF and Firearms Policy Coalition because they're doing stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and um, I'm, I'll just might as well say it now. Thank you for putting your, your hat in the, the arena and, um, you know, trying to, to make a difference. I, I wish you luck, obviously, Thank you. with the petition process. And hopefully you're nominated by the nominating committee. But if not, hopefully we can garner enough signatures by petition. Um, John, thanks thanks a bunch for, for coming along uh, again. And, and I'll look forward to chatting with you again soon. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. Yeah. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the conversation there. As always, I'll, I'll link to a lot of what we talked about here today in the in the show notes, I will go ahead and put the link to the petition for John um, to be petitioned onto the uh, to the election um, or to the ballot for the NRA Board of Directors. I'll also uh, put that ballot available natively to download on on the Forge of Freedom as well. Uh, so please please share that far and wide. Uh, don't forget to check out the Goals Conference. Um, go ahead and start making plans for that again next year. And then the last thing I want to mention is uh, we are hosting Ed Monk in Salem, Indiana on December 3rd. And I'm going to put this up on the screen for folks to see. He's going to be presenting um, about uh, the active shooter problem, a church focused study of the active shooter problem and how to minimize victims. I heard Ed Monk in Dallas at the NRA annual meeting, and his presentation was just fantastic. In fact, I have a friend who went to law school in Iowa, uh, and now works here in Southern Indiana as a prosecutor, and had a, a former law school classmate who's now a Supreme Court justice in Iowa. And the friend, my friend didn't know that I was hosting this uh, Ed Monk here in Salem, Indiana. Her former colleague from uh, Iowa called her, the Supreme Court justice, and said, hey, I saw Ed Monk's going to be close to you. You should go it's life changing. And I think that's absolutely uh, a fair assessment. It's not hyperbole. Uh, if you're in a church, if you're in any organization, uh, it could be a, a business uh, or a school. I think that the information that Ed Monk has to provide is in fact life changing. And so uh, we would love it if you could make it to the event here in Salem, Indiana. The information is there at Eventbrite that I've got up on the screen. I will share that in the show notes as well. So anyway, uh, thanks again, John, for, for coming along, and thanks, everybody, for, for tuning in. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to help us spread the message of freedom. As always, you can find us on YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, and all the most popular podcast streaming platforms. You can also find us on X at Forge of Freedom and at forgeoffreedom.com. Until next time, remember, you are the Forge of Freedom. <laughs>